Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. So hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jean Advos and I work at the SCC Library planning art events and exhibits along with Kristen Sanchez and Betty Montejano. This is our second to last art workshop in a five part virtual series. And today I'm so grateful to welcome Marcelina Gonzalez who takes us into her studio and teaches us all of her secrets of oil tinted resin collage. Uh, Marcelina comes to us from Brownsville, Texas. She's exhibited in New York, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Dallas. And in 2020, uh, you were awarded the grant by the Brownsville Beautification Committee uh, to create a mural for uh, Without Borders or Sin Fronteras. I'd also like to thank our administration, our faculty, all of you tuning in, and of course, Marcelina for sharing her knowledge with us. I hope all of you enjoy. And if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we will circle back at the end. Um, thank you. And please, everyone help me welcome Marcy. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. So um, like Dina said, my name is Marcelina or Marcy Gonzalez. Um, I am an artist born, raised, living, um, working in both the arts and the non-arts the non here in Brownsville, Texas. Um, in 2013, I completed my undergrad at the University of Texas at Brownsville in uh, studio arts. And I've had the honor and privilege to uh, exhibit my work um, in my hometown throughout Texas and um, throughout the United States and internationally um, since then. And to speak a little bit about my work, um, the work is really about honor honoring who I am and where I come from through storytelling. And the stories I tell speak on identity, culture, womanhood, memory, and um, really trying to figure out where I fit in as somebody who was born and raised here and came of age here um, along the border. Um, sometimes the, the central theme of the work um, can be a little difficult to confront. Um, I speak on things like feeling shame or uh, feeling inferior and really attempting to um, reconcile with those, with those feelings by um, converting all these experiences and memories um, into messages of empowerment and celebration. And to kind of counterbalance all of this, uh, this darkness or this heaviness of emotion I tend to work in uh, really bright imagery and uh, with playful narratives to um, to kind of counterbalance this. And I work in a really fun and unique medium called resin collage. So um, before I show you the materials and how I, I create the work, I kind of wanted to show some of my work um, in the past and how I've come to, uh, to work in this medium. So, um, I'm gonna share my screen, hopefully. Also, if there are any questions um, as they come up, go ahead and type them into the chat and I will answer them if I can. So um, when I uh, was completing and working on my undergrad, um, my medium of choice was painting originally but I really felt like I wasn't um, fully committed to the traditional definition of painting. I was always really interested in um, experimenting uh, and experimenting with materials like incorporating um, wood, wire, fiber, and, and other materials on a flat surface. And um, like during this time, I was in my early twenties and I was really trying to figure out my role in this world as a woman. And um, I was really looking for empowerment. And um, the imagery was uh, very aggressive and in your face. And I was really trying to express my own personal encounters of womanhood and sometimes the ugliness that, that, um, that comes with womanhood, um, you know, such as being objectified or, you know, sexism. And um, I feel like the work was, very bold, um, which is very unlike me characteristically as a human. Um, 
I'm really shy. I'm really anxious. I'm really reserved. I follow the rules. Um, this is all due to my upbringing. And um, I feel like the work made me really brave and it gave me a lot of confidence. And um, during this time, I was exploring um, different mediums and incorporating a lot of wood. And I was kind of creating these uh, wood collages. Um, and it was around this time, I think it was around 2018, I started working with resin. And um, it was completely accidental. Um, I was creating these these pins for my, my partner's band. and. Um, I was using resin to, to seal off the face of a pin and resin is like typically arts and craftsy. You can find it like at Michael's. So um, very DIY, I was pouring the resin and um, I let it cure overnight. And in the morning I noticed that the resin had dripped off onto the garbage bag that I was using to protect my table. And so out of curiosity, I kind of touched it and, and I found that it kind of, it peeled off the bag like really, really uniquely and I, I never really seen anything like that before it was like a uniform piece of plastic and I thought it was really interesting and it had been a really long time since since something had excited me in the arts I guess it it um it really got me thinking um that I wanted to to work with this material and um I was just thinking about it I'm thinking about it, how can I kind of do something really impactful with this with this material? And um, you know, like I said, typically it's considered kind of a, an arts and crafts project type of material. And I was thinking to myself, you know, is is resin like a valid form of art? You know, can I can I use it in the quotation art world? Will it will it be taken seriously? And, um, you know, those questions ultimately don't matter um, if you're creating work that that is uh, impactful, I think. Um, so as I was asking myself, you know, all of these questions, I, I found myself looking within and um, I was really spending a lot of time um, examining my own ideas and my thoughts and my feelings and you know who am I I was having a, a real crisis uh, around this time I, was, I think I was turning 30 so maybe it was having to do with that you know who knows but um I was asking myself all these questions and I was really thinking about memory and um how ineffective it can be and I was really looking back on my life and I found myself really having a difficult time and struggling uh, to retrieve like certain memories that I had. And I was questioning whether the memories that I did have were, were real or were they altered through the years. Um, and it was, it was something that I, I decided to, to use to create my work. And um, growing up here, I, I always felt very confused where I fit in. Um, I was raised primarily um, by my grandmother who only spoke Spanish and you know, I would go to school and, and I would wanna speak Spanish and I'd speak Spanish to my friends and then our teachers would get after us and tell us, no, don't do that. You, know, you have to speak English. And so I really felt like I had to kind of choose who I wanted to be. And, um, you know, it was, it was like a constant struggle. And um, it was something that I, I really had a hard time with at the time. Um, I found myself really struggling with my identity and I almost developed like a, a shame about, you know, my culture and, and where I came from, my family. I was really embarrassed of, of my circumstances, of the way my house looked, of the way I looked, and um, I was really ashamed of my culture and uh, like the way I was raised. Um, but um, you know, with with self examination, I think really comes um, 
the ability to to understand and to kind of look back and and uh, kind of see that what you had was precious and maybe wasn't really respected at the time. You know, I found this really true. And um, I was trying to understand all of the shame that I had when I was looking back during this time. And I couldn't figure it out at the time because looking back, I only had these really beautiful memories of, of growing up here with a family who, who uh, really loved and supported me. And I, I really didn't remember um, all this, uh, this shame. And so my work right now is uh, really about reconstructing my memories. And like I said earlier, it's all about celebration, uh, celebrating my culture, my upbringing, my family, and all these really important things that I didn't really respect and appreciate back then. Um, and all these memories are, are kind of centered around my experience growing up in this region. And um, all of this to kind of get to these works that kind of, they're supplemented with like photos, research, and um, like conversations with my family, which is something that I, I think is really special um, that this, this work has created a new, a new bond and a, like a new um, connection to, to my past. So um, I kind of um, wanted to show you the behind the scenes process of creating these works. Um, a lot of people ask me, like the one thing they ask is how, how did you make these works? And it's something kind of difficult to explain, you know, in, in, in the span of, you know, two minute conversations. So I thought it'd be fun to, to share that. So I'm going to exit this. So uh, my work always begins uh, digitally. And usually I, I alternate between, you know, using Photoshop or Procreate, which are, are programs for creating digital works. And um, this is kind of where I create the, the final image. Like I'll work it out on paper and then I'll, I'll transfer it to, to digital form. And so I'll create the image, I'll figure out the placement, you know, the dimensions and my color palette. And um, this illustration really plays a huge role in me physically creating the work and uh, using it as almost like a guide or something I reference back to. So in these programs, you can work um, like in layers. So each, each piece, is a different layer. And I'm gonna try and show you what I mean. So let's say my mom. So you can kind of see that that's its own individual layer. And then if you go uh, deeper into it, you can see like, let's say her hair. So that's a separate layer. And so these, a, these layers on, on this digital image kind of act as the layers on, um, on the actual physical work. And they, like this step also really dictates the order in which I'm gonna lay them down. Um, so uh, when I'm done creating the, this step, um, it kind of, like I said, it acts as a reference. So um, when I feel that this image is kind of um, ready to be transferred into uh, the physical work, um, it's really important that I keep track of all the layers because it's not going to be just this huge mess. So I'll go ahead before I... I create the, the actual resin layers. I, I take every single layer and I number them. And I, I guess it helps me to maintain some kind of order and it really eliminates 
um, all of the the guesswork and um, like I said, it it keeps the the process from being a mess. It's it's super tedious and um, I don't know. I find it very comforting to go through all these steps and kind of getting lost in in all of these numbers. Um, so this is going to help later down the line when I have to create the color palette, for example, and let's say, um, or like the skin tones. And if you notice, some of the layers are similar colors. So that'll help me in grouping them and measuring out how much um, paint I will need and how much resin I'll need. And this just keeps from, from being wasteful and, and from wasting time on things like that. So, um, Basically, this numbering part is the end of the digital aspect of the work. So um, I'm going to go ahead and show you now. After this step is done, um, I'll go ahead and go into my studio and um, switch to this camera. So when I get into my studio, um, which may or not may or may not be my garage, um, the first thing I do is create the 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 base that I'm working on. And um, so this is a piece I'm working on right now and it's still in the process of being finished, but I wanted to show what I work on and the base that I use. So I work on a really thin MDF board and it's mounted on uh, wood. So during this time when I'm building it, um, cutting the wood, I'm sanding, I'm painting the, the edge of the, the wood. I'm also installing this uh, backing mechanism so I don't do that at the end and risk damaging the work like I've done so many times before. So um, next I'll start with, with um, pouring the resin. And so I always have like a digital printout of the work for reference. And um, so I use it to kind of see the sizes of each, each layer. And it really helps me understand how much resin I'm gonna need for each layer. Um, I, also, I also keep track of all those numbers that I had uh, reference on the digital image. And um, like these notes are, are groupings of different layers. So when I tackle them, it won't be uh, difficult. And it helps me kind of keep track of, um, of the same colors of the same um, like objects, like, you know, this, uh, this bottle of shampoo, I'll, I'll tackle that and then layer it on top of the other piece. So I also have these notes and they're very helpful. And like I said, helps me keep track of the process. And um, so I'll get started on prepping so I can begin pouring. And um, I work on, this is a table that I built and there are these, uh, like wooden panels and they're really great because I can kind of like mark on them and uh, kind of create little little notes here and there kind of to remind myself where the resins might go and, and which number, which layer. And um, so they usually end up looking like a bunch of little blobs throughout the table. And they're typically numbered A through Z. So here's an example, the, the blue inner tub number one is A, B, C, D. And um, for example, B, the light blue details of the tub are layers two through five. So I'll go ahead and with some tracing paper, I'll find those layers and um, group them and kind of uh, create, like I said, like a blob of all these layers. And I'll go ahead and transfer them onto onto this uh, this table. So um, let's say I am going to work on the foot. So these two feet are the same color, so they will represent 
um, so the the same the same color is going to be used. So I'll um, cut this out and kind of trace it on the table. And this is going to be the blob that is going to be used for the feet. So, um, like I said, I'll go ahead and name them A, B, one, whatever, whatever notes I had made on the, the papers to go ahead and let myself know um, what layers, which, what colors, which. And, um, and so I'll do this for every single layer. And I don't do all of this in one day. Usually um, I'll kind of find, um, like a pretty pretty good amount of of layers that I can work in one day, but being realistic because like I said, I do have like a normal non-art job and um, time management is um, like as when you're a working artist, it's uh, really critical that you you keep um, you keep yourself accountable, I guess and and know that you don't have all the time in the studio so. I'll go ahead and group all these layers that I can tackle like in in a night or or on the weekend. So um, after I have all these groupings on the table, um, I work with this clear drop cloth. And um, like I had mentioned my my story on on um, discovering this process, I um, I was able to peel it off a bag. So um, by, by taping this on the table, it acts as like a protective barrier and um, it keeps the resin from fusing onto, onto this wood. And so like after it's cured, it can easily be peeled away from the plastic. And I saved a little piece so I can kind of show you this. So this is a cured piece, and this is kind of what it looks like after I let it sit for the night. And it kind of like peels away. And then you're left with um, like a sheet of plastic. So, so um, next we move on to the color palette. And I mentioned that I was, a painter when I was I was completing my undergrad so um like during this time I really accumulated a lot of, of oil paints and a really I have a really large collection that um I have on hand so after um you know a lot of experimentation I found that oil paint and resin kind of melt into each other so I use oil paint to create my palette and I work on this palette paper and um, and once again, I'm, I'm referencing this digital image when creating uh, the color palette. And I'll look at the digital image for, for the accurate color. And uh, one of the funnest parts I thought of painting was creating the, the color palettes and mixing paints. And I, I always had a really, fun time with that. So I'm glad that I can, I can still uh, use my paints and, and um, really happy that I was able to incorporate it into my new works. So as you can see, they're, they're each numbered once again, referencing my, my papers. And that kind of, like I said, helps me keep track of, of the, the colors and how much paint I'll need and what layer they're referring to. So once I have the, the color palette, and it's really important that um, when I create the color palette, I know that um, I'll be pouring the resin that night because like these, they're already hardened and, and they won't, they won't um, melt into the resin. So once again, that calls back to time management and kind of planning out the whole process. Um, so once I have the blobs, once I have the color palette, once I have um, the protective layer, I'll go ahead and 
grab my resin and I use a two part AB resin and um, throughout this whole um, process from when I started using resin, I it was a lot of trial and, and error and using different products and um, you know trying to be cheap and using uh, the most inexpensive stuff. But sometimes you have to you know invest in a, a higher quality that's that's you know non toxic and orderless because um, some of the cheap resins really are terrible for you to inhale if you're not working in a well ventilated area. So. Um, I use craft resin, which is uh, really great because there's no smell, no smells or um, any dangerous chemicals in these, and they're a little more pricey, of course. But um, in the end, I feel like uh, it's a good investment. You've got to protect yourself, take care of yourself. Um, so, like I said, I'll go ahead and pour the resin A B, which is equal parts, and. Um, um, so I'll, I'll mix however much I think I need and, and pour them into the blobs. And, um, I use let me find my tool, this baby spatula. So I use this baby spatula and I scoop up the paint and I, I mix it into the resin and it'll create, um, the color. It'll, it'll be diluted a little bit because of the the actual resin, even though it's clear, it does remove some of the opacity. So um, I kind of see how much paint I'm gonna need to, to fill so that it's um, a solid opaque color. And um, you really have to be careful in kind of like mixing everything, making sure there's no um, no blobs or sometimes little, little bugs like to, to crawl in there. And you gotta be very careful because if you leave it overnight, uh, you're going to have a piece of plastic um, with a hardened bug in it. And that's that's ruined many pieces of mine throughout this uh, process of discovery and trying to figure out how, how this works. So um, once everything is poured and all the color palette is mixed into the resin, I'll go ahead and let it cure overnight. And then I'll come back in the next morning. Um, and I'll peel all the, the different colors away like I had uh, shown you a little while ago. And once again, I'll keep track of them. And I kind of wanted to show you um, how tedious this process is. So I'm going to share my screen again. How I keep track of all of these different layers. You can see they're all numbered and they're all. Um, like grouped, um, once again, referencing back to, to my, um, my notes. So I could, um, so I can keep track of all that. Okay. So uh, once I have all those layers, I'll go ahead and cut them up. And um, the, the morning after I pour, the resin is still kind of flexible. And so um, I used heavy duty scissors to kind of like cut the um, cut the blobs away, um, referencing these different layer sizes. And it's just like a rough a rough cutout. Um, when I get to working to kind of sorting out the details of the piece, like for example, um, I mean, I think this is an image of a little girl, like for example, this hand has details where, where you need something a little more precise. And so I use a Dremel to do that. And it has different, um, I have different sizes that I can uh, replace and, and use uh, depending on where I need to, to cut and how detailed I need to get. And this is a really fun tool to use and definitely took some trial and error and and getting used to but um has become a really necessary part of the process 
um, you know, as I get more comfortable with this medium and trying to like push it a little farther and working larger scales and, and uh, working with more details. Um, so once all the, the pieces are cut, I'll kind of start arranging them to, to mimic the layers that I had referenced on the, the digital image. And um, so like I said, I'm, I'm keeping track of all the layers and, and all the numbers. And usually I'll work in groups. Like I believe I did this, um, did the floor first and I did the, the sidewall first. And um, you know, the tiling, it's all like grouped into different days and, and um, into uh, manageable scales, because I, like I said, I can't do everything in one day and everything has to kind of follow the steps. And with that um, comes all, you know, this, these notes and, and keeping everything in order. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you this piece that I'm working on. Um, so like I said, I, I kind of work in sections and collage everything on top of, of each other. And um, so um, like I had said, I, I'll reference the digital image and I'll, I'll reference the, the layers and, and the order in which they were um, kind of created. And, um, and that's how I'll continue and know where I left off and, and be able to manage everything. Um, so I'm, I'm almost done with this piece. So you can see. Um, and this piece, I kind of wanted to um, work on it a little and kind of talk to you um, about it. Um, it references, um, you know, themes of motherhood, um, tradition, uh, story, storytelling, um, and kind of, like I had mentioned, um, coming to terms and I guess celebrating where you came from. Um, the work entitled to this piece is called Chicken Pox Bath. And, um, these pieces have really opened up like conversations with my family and my mother in particular. Um, we're like a really close family, but I'd say that we're really like closed off and we don't share very much. Um, of course, like if you ask, they will share, but they're not gonna sit down and, and say, hey, let me tell you my life story. So through these works and, and my mom in particular seeing these works, she has become more comfortable with kind of flipping through the photo album and sharing different stories and, um, you know, just sharing more, which has been really wonderful and I'm so grateful for. Um, and so she told me about this story after she had come to one of my shows and she, uh, she had told me that, I think this was early nineties. This was before the chicken pox vaccine came out. And, um, um, my mom was told by her mom to, if, you know, one of your children gets chicken pox, you, um, you like put your other child in the bathtub with him or her and expose the other one, which is, you know, not what you're supposed to do. It's actually super dangerous. And, um, so, I mean, this image is kind of trying to share that story and it's definitely like a story of um like growth and understanding and um you know traditions and family and um so it is let me share these pieces so it it shows my mother who used to wear this really beautiful satin robe. Um, and I thought it was just, she looked like a queen in it. It was like so sensual and beautiful and it would just flow as she would walk through the house. And I am still on the hunt for my own very, my very own satin robe. But so it's my mom and she, um, 
during this time she was like going to school um she was taking night classes and um she was really trying to just give us a better life and um so these moments she said were really special to her like just giving like remove the chicken pox, pox bath from just like the the act of of giving your child a bath was really uh, special to her um so it's my mom it's me and i love little mermaid and so did my sister which is my little sister and um so we're here taking our shared bath and um we we lived in a really old house and um my mom would always um she would always tell me like oh i was so embarrassed of our bathtub like it had this this like mold and I no matter how hard I scrubbed like it would never it would never ever come off and she was really embarrassed about having people over and them judging her for stuff like that um so um I kind of that was like a uh, like a nod to her to to let her know that you know even though you're embarrassed like this moment is beautiful and uh another conversation we had was that she kind of confessed to me that she would um she would lighten our hair so that um, there was a shampoo that would lighten your hair. And um, this was kind of suggested by her own mother. And I guess it was pretty common. And um, definitely very common, like as a, a grandmother, I think, or to kind of pull out photos of your grandchildren and and um, they're like, oh, look at my my granddaughter like look at her hair like how lighter skin is and um i feel like it's racism and discrimination stuff like that are very prevalent in and within the latino community and um even within you know our own families so um i thought that was really interesting that was something that i didn't know um my grandma really she was like Put this in your in her hair you know we want them to look more green that so that's something that um that i learned through through creating this work and um i mean ultimately removing the the story behind this this work the story that i would only know unless you know i share it in a, like with somebody during a show or you know um and Ultimately, it's just um, at face value, re removing all those like deep metaphors and little nods to my mom and you know her stories. Um, I feel like it's just a, a really sweet snapshot view of you know a really sweet moment, um, a really sweet moment of love. And um, I thought that it'd be fun to finish this piece up on camera so you can actually if you're a visual learner like me you can kind of understand better by seeing it so okay so let's see before i begin i kind of um i look at it and i'll kind of um figure out where, where I need to begin and what makes sense. So I see that I, I still need to attach the back of my mom's hair here. And I have these pieces. This is all I have left from that huge notebook of, of pieces. So I'll see that this is labeled number 14. You can't really see, but it's label number 14. And here's number 14. I'm going to go ahead and take it off. And um, I use this super glue to, to attach the individual layers on top of one another. And that really, um, it's very quick. And it's not very strong. So I don't know if you noticed that this broke right now. And this happens a lot so it's it's uh it's not very strong but it's easy to to work with and um 
it's not that difficult to repair. So I'll go ahead and line up these pieces, get the hair, the back layer of the hair and kind of line it up using the, the printout as uh, like a guide. And I'll tape this down so it doesn't move. And, um, and I'll go ahead and uh, use the glue and glue it on top. And I'll match everything up so that it sits where it's supposed to. So I'm just gonna dab a little glue here. And then I'm gonna line it up. And I'll try and line it up everywhere that I see. And I'll just hold that down for a few seconds and it should be good to go. And sometimes I do get, um, you know, glue that, that spills out and that's okay because one of the last steps I do is, let me show this piece. Like once everything's done, I give it an entire clear coat and that kind of creates like a uniform solid slab. So um, these little, little errors will quickly get uh, deleted and you won't be able to see them. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and work on the feet next. Here are the feet. And I'm gonna go ahead once again, and I'm gonna line them up with the, the image, tape the feet down. And it's just so um, the piece doesn't move around. And, and like I said, the, the glue is pretty quick drying, so it'll be more of a headache to, to repair that. It is possible, but I like to try and avoid those little headaches if they are avoidable. So I'm gonna go ahead and hold that down. And I'm gonna go ahead and look at this piece. And let's do her left hand. So that's 10 and 12. And here's 10 and 12, and I've already cut out the hand and glued it on previously. And carefully lift that off. And I'm gonna lift this up. I can kind of make some space and see where that's gonna line up. Tape it down real quick. And I'm gonna dab some glue. Hold that down. And then I'll do this last hand. Take it down once again. And these last steps are just really fun, uh, just to kind of see everything come together is my favorite part. Go behind here, and glue, put it down. And I'll go ahead and start removing the tape as I'm holding these pieces down. And when I'm almost done, sometimes it gets stuck and you just gotta gently wiggle it. Let's go to the, the working piece. So this is gonna be just like a rough, I still need to attach the this back tub, I, I miscalculated and I didn't have enough. So what I do make sure to always keep our extra 
pieces so I can go back and add them because um, finding the exact color that you mix is really difficult and trying to match it is just a lot of work. So that's gonna be pretty, pretty easy to fix. So I just wanna show you what it's going to look like roughly and kind of get. And this is gonna go under. And then I have this last piece, which is the top hair. And this kind of goes on top to kind of show that, you know, your mom is really scrubbing that head. And then we got this little annoying little sis playing with my mom's back hair. It's kind of the overall finished piece. And that'll go ahead and be, be glued down. And like I said, once it's dry, I'll, I'll give it one final pour over everything to kind of unify everything into one solid piece. So that's the end of the process and the, the behind the scenes. So I think we can answer some questions. Um, okay. Hi, Marcelina. Hi. That was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm always fascinated uh, with artwork about memory. And I love the way um, your artwork has opened up conversations of, with your family. Because those are often so hard to have. Right? They really are. And, you know, they're so precious. And, um, you don't know how long you're going to have with your family. So I really am very grateful of that. Um, it's opened this door. So we wrote some of the questions down, uh, mostly in the chat. If you look at it, everybody's just really impressed with your process. Thank you. Um, and how intricate and detailed you are about everything. Um, so I think you covered kind of some of this, but uh, what inspired you to create a collage um, out of this material? Um, or what inspired you to do art is your passion? Um, yeah, so just a very quick summary of my, my art journey. I really uh, struggled a lot with my mental health um, growing up and throughout my teen years. Um, I was really depressed and, and uh, tried to work through that and I got into the arts because of that and it will really helped me like express myself and um, share my feelings and and I pursued it as um, uh, I pursued it further and, and studied in, in school and and I'm, I've just been you know trying to keep sharing and um, I guess I'd like celebrate um, where I come from and you know who I am and that's a very brief brief uh, description but you're doing a great job Thank I'm you. in such awe whenever you create digitally like the previous like before you work in the resin um so someone was asking uh, what program are you using um if I'm on desktop I'll use um photoshop and like I said I'm a working artist so I my full-time job is away from the arts so I find that um, this this um, this resin collage, and particularly using a uh, medium like like digital work, is really great for me because it it is I can do it mobily or remotely. Um, so I can I can do it during lunchtime or you know um, away from the studio, and I don't have to physically be in the studio, you know, or for something like painting, for example. Like that's. Um, not something that you can, you know, carry around easily. So I use Photoshop if it's desktop and I work on an iPad as well. And the program is Procreate. Somebody asking how many days does it take? Um, like for instance, the one that you're working on this very intricate, how many days would that take to complete? Um, that's something that I can give you an answer to because 
for this piece, I started tracking um, the hours because I was really curious, you know, you, you go and exhibit your work and you put a price, like, am I underselling myself? Am I charging too much? Like, am I worth this much? But um, I really wanted to get like a good, um, like an accurate reading of the time that I actually do physically um, spend creating the work, whether it be um, digitally or, you know, cutting out the different layers and, or, you know, building the, the wood pieces. So this piece um, has been total so far 43 hours. Wow. And I think I only need about, uh, you know, an hour or two to kind of say that I'm done and completely finished. Wow. That's so many. <laughs> uh, and what size is it? The This one is uh, 16 by 16 wow. or 18 by 18. I'm not sure. Usually I like to wear uh, to work in um, like square sizes. So I think it might be 16 around there. It's not too big, but it's definitely bigger than these little babies. <laughs> I love the little small ones too. I Oh. Yeah, these are like little studies. Like um, during the pandemic, I had a really hard time working on these really serious, you know, stories and just dealing with my mental health and all that. So this is kind of like warm ups, um, kind of getting used to the medium again and uh, comfortable with it. So that's why they're small, they're manageable and just little quick studies. Nice. Um, we did some, we did two art talks earlier where Marcy talked about art therapy and these pieces in the pandemic and those are on YouTube I think so in terms of your development process is there any time that you get overwhelmed by the steps time and many layers that you need to add and if so how do you push yourself to continue working um Hmm, that's a great question. I do find sometimes that it is overwhelming and that usually is reflective on my, my own mood, like my mental health. Um, and it's really important to, that I'm able to recognize that it's me and that, um, you know, I kind of have to take a little break and because usually if I am feeling good and I'm in a, you know, okay place, um, like all these processes, like all these steps are really comforting to me and they're they are um something that I welcome like it keeps my brain completely occupied so if I do find that it's you know a little too much it's um kind of a, a sign to myself hey you need to take a break you need to work on something else you need to watch tv you need to you know whatever step away but I'm usually able to recognize uh, when it's time to, to step away or to start on another piece that might not be as as meaningful to me or important, you know, it's all about uh, recognizing those signs so I can I can help myself move forward. Right. And going through the chat and everybody's just really um, impressed and saying that you're amazing. But um, thank you. I um, what is a, I guess one last question, what is a short-term goal and long-term goal you have with your art? Um, short-term goal as of right now is just, um, being able to, to exhibit and show my work, um, because for so long, well, since the pandemic, I kind of got really scared of going out and, um, that led to me kind of um, alienating my friends, my family. So um, it's been really huge that I, I'm able to, to physically be at shows and to care enough to want to be in shows. Um, and long term um, is just holding myself accountable and um, being able to continue working and continue working with art and I also work with my family. So that's really important that, um, that I continue doing because even though it is away from the arts, it is um, a family business and something that's really important that I am a part of. And, um, so that's why I'm not working in the arts and, you know, like a, 
a traditional way, you know, like working in a museum or, or something like that. So just um, holding myself accountable and making sure that I can, I can continue making art uh, as long as it makes me happy. That's wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm um, so happy that you would share with us today. Um, I think one of the reasons your artwork speaks so much to me is that like your images, they cross so many boundaries. Like they remind me of my own memories that I never thought I had or like <laughs> that I can't recall. Um, and it takes you to a special place. It, or it takes me to a special place in my mind. I get told a lot that they're very nostalgic. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. I'm very happy when somebody tells me their own stories. And... Alex is saying that you have a wonderful website and that you, yeah. he got to buy some work from you. Um, and everybody just says, thank you. So thank you so much for um, having me. So thank you everyone for coming and I uh, hope you have a good day. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Bye.